Chapter 4 The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks Michelle woke to hot-eyed pain. Blinking away tears, he coughed, tried to sit up, and groaned as his skull protested. He closed his eyes and focused on his breathing. It had been one of the first lessons the Chevaliers had taught them. To master the outside world, he had to master himself. He felt the air enter his lungs, felt the heart pumping blood to muscles that ached, but were still ready to obey his commands. His arms and legs were bound. Rope, not shackles. The cut on his side, he refused to dignify with something so small with the word wound. Burned with pain, but was shallow enough to be nothing more than an annoyance. He flexed his muscles, testing the bindings and restoring circulation. Two more breaths clearing the remains of the choking dust Gaspard's bard had flung into his face. When Michel had mastered himself, he opened his eyes. He was in a warehouse, tied to a post and surrounded by crates that effectively formed a room. Light crept into the moon through small, bared windows and hung suspended in glittering dust motes. The floor was simple dirt, and the crates stank of rotting fu fruits and old cloth. Outside, he heard the clatter of wagon wheels and distant shouts that told him that he was still in Val Royale. But no one in the merchant district would have, their let would have let their warehouse remain in this starry state. He was in the slums then. The bard had taken his swords and daggers and stripped his jacket, leaving him in a simple linen undershirt with a red stained tear along the ribs. Michelle had no hidden weapons. The Chevaliers trained warriors, not assassins. At the sound of footsteps, Michelle straightened. The code of the Chevaliers allowed for the use of surprise and tactical ambushes, contrary to the way foolish Chevaliers acted in plays for the peasants. Had he some way to get freed, he would have feigned sleep and then attacked without shame. But without such an option, he refused to show weakness before an enemy. Melkinda came around the corner and into the little cave of crates. Already awake. She dropped to one knee, safely out of reach in case he tried to kick at her. Impressive. The men back at the tavern are all, all still unconscious. Those who aren't dead, of course. What do you want? Michelle's throat still burned from whatever had been in the pouch, but he kept his voice from breaking. Perhaps I just wish to get to know you. Melkinder smiled sweetly and tossed her dark curls over her shoulder. We didn't have time for a proper introduction at Celine's banquet, and you were otherwise occupied in the tavern today. She stood and pressed a fine-fingered hand to one of the crates, then pulled it back and rubbed her fingers. I apologize for the accommodations. We're in the Elven District, near the big tree in the Market Square. Even without your mask, you're a little too well known to stay, where someone might see you. Then she looked down at him and smiled. But you're not really that well known, are you? What do you want? Michelle asked again. Melkinder sighed. No space in your chevalier is hard for a simple courtesy. But then I don't think you came from a family where courtesy was taught. At his silence, she smiled again. Did you know your patron, Comte Brevin de Chalon, donated his library to the University of Orléans upon his death? Comte Brevin was an avid scholar. Michel said, and Melkinder smiled, evidently pleased that they were having a conversation. So he was. Now, the tricky thing is that the servants can sometimes be sloppy with the books. It's so easy to put a list of financial transactions in with a study of the Kari or the healing properties of ground dracorns. Melkinder coyly put a finger to her cheek and affected a thoughtful look. When it came to your training, Sir Michel, he spent a great deal. My family died when I was young, Michel said, keeping his voice even, and Comte Brevin took me in. He also paid for my induction to the Academy de Chevalier. Melkinder shook her head. 
There's a man in Montfort they call Le Mage du Sang. At Michelle's blank look, she caught her head, thinking. So you were never told? Your patron, Comte Brevin, paid the man quite a sum on your behalf. Michelle's jaw clenched. A blood mage? That is a lie, Bard. Comte Brevin was a good man. Good enough to see a boy of ten fighting off three larger boys in an alley, and ordered his coach to stop and help. Good enough to take the boy in and offer a hot meal and a chance. As the old noble had put it, to put that strength to better use than squabbling for scraps. He would never trade in blood mages. Ah, but this was but a name, Melkinder said, giving her a flirtation giving him her flirtatious smile again. You see, Le Mage de Song is actually a scribe and an expert in heraldry and legal documents. He gained his name from his ability to conjure noble blood out of thin air. Michel had been living for three years in Comte Brevin's household when he was awakened by his lord, who had come into his room quietly with a piece of paper that changed everything. Brevin said that Michelle's skill with a blade would be wasted in a position as a guard or mercenary. He had said that Michelle had a rare gift, and gifts must be nurtured for the good of the Empire. And finally, he had said that if the Academy de Chevalier only accepted those of noble blood, well, there were nobles lying dead who had further, no further use for their names, and their departed spirits would be honored to lend their titles to such a worthy cause. Melkinder almost seemed sad, staring at him, and Michelle realized that he had given something away in his silence. He recorded a payment, quite a large payment in fact. He must have believed in you quite highly, she sighed. And he was right. You have become Celine's champion. Yes. I am the Empress's champion, Michelle said, and you serve Gaspard. So why do I still draw breath? Because dead, you would be a martyr slain by the Grand Duke as an act of villainous treachery, Melkinder said, kneeling back down beside him. But alive, and with your false claim to, to nobility brought to light, you would disgrace your Empress. Imagine the trial, the public execution, the scandal. Michelle. That is why you are still alive. Yet in her victory, she did not seem happy. There was a weakness in her smile as her eyes fled from his. I would sooner die, he told her. I know, she nodded and let out a slow breath. And it seems a waste either way. I have seen my share of tournaments, and I can say with no small certainty that you were a man born to wield a blade. Who cares whether you are truly a noble? She shook her head bitterly. I play the game better than most courtiers, and I was born the bastard daughter of a milkmaid and a soldier on leave. It is a lie, they tell us, to keep us in our place. Perhaps, Michelle shrugged, trying to seem unconcerned. But we still have found ourselves here. Melkinder gave him the sad smile again. At least you serve a mistress who cares for those not of noble blood. You have that. I have I heard she forced the university to let in not just a commoner, but an elf. Ah, there it is. Then her sadness was gone, and her pleased cat in the cream smile was back. And Michel cursed himself for a fool for talking to an Orlesian bard and thinking he could play upon her sympathy. The cold, tight feeling of dread washed over him, but he kept his face impassive. There what is. I did tell you that I grew up on a farm. Melkinder sat beside him now with easy familiarity. Terribly dull, which is why I fled as soon as I could and found a new life and a new name. I'm sure you can sympathize, she elbowed him playfully, but I do remember a few things. When you mate a white cow with a black bull, you get cows with black and white spots. 
When you mate a gray mare with a black stallion, you get a gray fowl. Although that fowl one day might one day grow up to sire a black fowl himself. It's like a little of the black stayed in the blood. That's how it works with cattle and horses and, well, with everything, really. She knew. But when a human, Melkinder said, as though discussing the weather, mates with an elf, the offspring is always human. No oven ears, no big pretty eyes, just a human. No way to tell him from a, a real man. She glanced over and added, unless he gives it away himself. Michelle swallowed. Gaspard wanted you removed, and he asked that I hunt for information he could use against you. But he asked that I not kill you unless absolutely necessary. He's such a gentleman. She smirked. He would have been pleased beyond measure when I told him that you were a commoner hiding behind false title. When I tell him that you're the son of some knife-tiered whore, can you imagine what he will do to Celine's little court? She said it coyly, with a smile that she had found a naughty little secret. She was pleased with herself, willing to let Michelle beg for mercy or offer her a better deal. Or maybe she was toying with him again, looking to get even more information, like the trained spy and manipulator she was. Sir Michelle smashed his forehead into her face. As she fell on her side, he rolled to his back and shoved his arms down, hooked his hands under his curled feet, and then brought him up, still bound over Melkinder's head. He looped, twisted, and pulled the rope taut, and her cries of pain choked off into frantic gurgles. I am Sir Michelle de Chevin, he said as he pulled on the rope around her throat. With the last of her strength, Melkinder slid a dagger free from a sheath at her hip. Before she could bring it to bear, Michelle yanked his hands up, then slammed them down, smashing Melkinder's head against the ground. She went limp, and he did it again. Then again. I am Sir Michelle de Chivin. He grabbed the dagger from her un unresisting hand and sawed through the ropes that bond it, bound him. In moments, he was free, standing over her. Her breast still moved with breath. I am Sir Michel de Chivin, he said again, as he knelt beside her and finished it with a clean cut. When he came back to his feet, Gaspard's men were there. Brielle had grown up believing in the Maker and living in accordance with the chant of light. Much of that belief had been had spilled onto the reading room floor with her parents' blood, and though Falassen had been reluctant to teach her too much of the old way of the ways of the elven gods, she had quietly come to look to Andruel, goddess of the hunt, with reverence. But for all that, she thought of herself as having cast off her chantry upbringing. Watching Falassin practice magic still raised the hairs on the back of her neck. Riala's mentor held the feather to his forehead, closed his eyes, and passed his hand over it. The feather glittered once, as though the afternoon sun shone more brightly upon it, and Falassin nodded. Shall we? Without further comment, he started walking. What is it like? Brielle asked, walking beside him. They were heading da towards the slums, an unlikely place for Celine's champion. She nodded to an elven merchant she'd helped last year and got a surreptitious smile in return. Blasson seemed to consider the question carefully. Finally, he glanced over her and said, Itchy. Itchy? Brielle glared. That is... not a helpful answer. Consider asking better questions, Dolan. Blasson grinned. Asking a mage to describe magic is like asking you to describe a sunset to a blind dwarf. 
If his cloak slipped off and the tattoos on his face were revealed, every elf in the marketplace would either throw themselves at his feet or draw blades to fight this creature out of legend. And for all of that, he didn't bother to put on boots, and he wore clothes that would better suit a woodsman than a living myth. He told bad jokes and refused to take anything in the world of men seriously. She wondered if that was the why he moved through the world untouched. How are the Dalish? she asked. You've not spoken of your people. Beneath his cloak, his face lit up with enthusiasm. They have a wonderful new plan. It ends with the Shenlin killing each other off, leaving the Dales free for the elves to rule. Riala raised an eyebrow. How does it begin? Riding around in wagons pulled by deer. They're still working on the middle. How fortunate they have you, Riala said. And Falasin chuckled and shook his head. Do you ever tire of it, Riala? Yes, then. Walking among the fools, bending them to your will with a word here and a gesture there. Riala, st Riala started to answer, then stopped at Falasin's stare. It was intent almost angry, his eyes glittering inside the shadows of his cloak. She thought of the Ch Chatelaine, the captain of the palace guard. She thought of the countless nobles who ignored her or called her rabbit. She thought of Celine's soft fingers trailing down her bare arm. I believe I am doing good work, she finally said. Vlasen nodded and looked away. Yes, that lasts for a while. They entered the slums. There were more elves than men now, and the looks they shot Briel and Flassen were narrowed-eyed and angry. Flassen could easily be one of them, with his simple clothes and his hidden face. Briel, by contrast, wore a clean dress that had never been patched, and fine leather boots that still had enough sole to ch clap on the stones with each step. Even without a mask, every elf who had laid eyes on her could see that she served the nobles. She had turned ba her back. She had turned her back on her people. For a moment, as she always did, she wanted to try and explain. She could tell them the truth, that they had an ally in the Imperial Palace. They would hear about elves being accepted into, in the upper markets and the university, and they would. And then, as she always did, she sighed to herself and kept walking ignoring the angry looks. It's hard to impress someone with the absence of a negative, Lassen said without looking over. Look, you say. Did you notice how nobody came to your house and beat you to death for not bowing fast enough yesterday? You're welcome. It's getting better. Of course it is. I'm here. As Briella chuckled, Flassen asked, added, And you are doing good work, and the day when you can accept that they'll never really understand, or appreciate it, or know just how much you did? What? Briella asked. Is that the day it gets easier? Middle's bosom, no, Flassen chuckled. Honestly, it makes your heart shrivel up and die inside you. Put it off as long as you can. Oh, your champion was in here not long ago. Gone now, though. He had stopped outside an ugly shack of a tavern, whose saging wooden walls were covered with crude drawings and misspelled slurs etched in char charcoal. Brella nodded and stepped inside. It was empty, save for an elf behind the bar who glared as she came in. We're closed, he snapped, cleaning up from last night's brawl. She nodded absently and looked. The barman's knuckles were white on the glass he was gripping too tightly. He'd ever been paid or threatened to keep his silence. Dark splinters from recently broken furniture were mixed in with the sawdust. And much of the sawdust was on the floor was fresh, thrown down not long ago with time to soak up ale and dirt. On a table nearby was a trace of red. Looks like it was more than just a few hours ago. It was last night. The elf at the bar said. He put his glass down and put his hands on the counter. 
Have you ever wondered how hot someone's fingernails have to get before they melt right onto their fingers? Blasen asked as he leaned against the bar, pulling his hood back slightly. Because it's something I've been thinking about, about a lot lately. The barman looked at Flassen's tattooed face and went pale. He lifted his hand from back from the counter very slowly. Thank you. Briala moved toward the table and caught a trace of sour, acrid scent. She occasionally used poisons in her work, and she recognized the hint of deep mushroom that suggested choke powder. He, she looked at the barman, then at Felassen. Felassen. Come on. He nodded and led out her outside. Trap? It looks that way. He was attacked by a group and then taken down with poison. Poisons. Charming. Felassen made a face. Yes, they're so much less dignifying than melting someone's fingernails to their fingers. Oh, don't be silly. Flassen said, waving her words away. The fingernail just turns black and falls off, and usually the finger swells up and bursts long beforehand. I'll bear that in mind, Haren. Can you sense where Sir Michel was taken? Of course. Good. I just need to make one stop, then. She led her mentor through a maze of alleys, ignoring the looks from shadowy fingers figures playing games with dice and daggers, and trusting to the confidence of her stride to keep her safe, at least during daylight hours. She ducked into a crumbling stone building, its door unmarked. Inside, it looked no different than any other squatter's den, though it was empty at this time of day. She found the right stone in the wall, pressed it gently, and felt the cash come free. Another stone in the wall, identical to casual inspection, fell open, revealing a drawer inside. The bow Briella drew out was red cedar, good enough to be worth using, not so good as to draw attention. The daggers were silverite, more noticeable, but only if drawn. The arrows were coated with death root toxin, their, their tips sealed to keep the poison fresh until she needed it. Blassen, Felsen grinned. You have a ca cash in every section of the city? You taught me well. Brow closed the drawer, reset the latch, and left the building. Let's go. Lassen led the way, and soon they were in one of the oldest neighborhoods in the city. Dirty and cramped. And soon they were in one of the oldest... Oops. Dirty and cramped. It was the, the first section of the city to be home to the elves, the closest thing to a frilled and alienage. They passed no humans on the thin and crooked streets any longer, and the elves who lived here would likely never even see the upper market. Blassen paused as they came to a great tree in the market square. The venadal was decorated with ribbons, and the dirt around it was marked with sticks stuck into the earth and decorated with bits of bright cloth hung as offerings. The tree of the people, Braille said. Your people. And yours. Blassen looked away, though you don't think so. It's a nice tree, Fosun said. Let it just be a nice tree. Briella was about to reply when the sound of booted feet and jangling armor came from around the corner, and without a word, both of them slid into the shadows. The soldiers wore no coat of arms, but were fitted with red steel, chainmail, and long swords. Too expensive for common thugs, Falassin murmured as the men filled in filed into a warehouse at the edge of the square, and not from your empress. No. She'd send her men in full armor, or assassins in plain clothes. Gaspard's men. Flassen nodded. Well, this is good news. Briella looked over. I'm not entirely certain if you're being serious. Flassen rolled his eyes. You don't send that many mercenaries to carry a dead body, Delenn. Point taken. Briella stood. The simple servant's dress let her move, though she hadn't planned on fighting in it. Next time I'll have to leave armor in the safe houses as well. Every safe house? What if you gain weight? Can you imagine replacing that many suits of armor? <sighs> Briella let out a long breath. Shall we hunt? Let's. Without breaking stride, 
Flaston drew forth a stake from the folds of his clothes, cloak, and it twisted and grew like a living thing, until a moment later it was a mage's staff whose head swirled with emerald light. Together they entered the building at a run. The warehouse was shabby even for the slums. Piles of old crates rotted on a dirt floor, stat still stacked high enough to turn the warehouse into a maze, though whatever they had held had long since spoiled and been forgotten. Stains on the ground and weapon scars in the wood told Briella that the building had become a meeting place for smugglers and a dumping ground for murderers, and the cold air carried the stale smell of unwashed bodies and cheap drugs. Somewhere in the warehouse, metal rang on metal, and men grunted in pain. Briella looked at the maze of crates, then scrambled up one makeshift wall. Moldy wood crumbled under her fingers, and the whole stack of crates swayed dangerously. But moments later, she had reached high enough to look down upon the rest of the warehouse. I know you want to embrace your heritage, Felsen called back at her as she darted into the maze. We don't all climb trees. You've confused us with squirrels again. Ass. Looking down, Briella saw that Sir Michel de Chivin was unarmored. Standing over the body of the bard Melkinder with a dagger in one hand and a stolen longsword in the other. One of the enemy soldiers was down, but Michel hadn't been able to hold the doorway of the alley they had had him in, and he was flanked. There were at least half a dozen men still on their feet, and Michel favored a wound on the side. Left, then right. Blesson made his way through the maze towards Michel, following her directions, and Brielle lifted the, her bow sighted, aimed, released a breath, and released her first arrow. It always felt good. She wasn't sure whether it was the rush of violence, real or imagined, or simply the thrill of being naturally gifted at something that even Celine had found difficult. For a moment, she could almost follow the arrow as it slid through liquid air and sank into the throat of the man on Michelle's left. She was drawing again even as the first man fell and Michelle's face went blank with shock. However surprised he was at the unexpected help, though, he was still one of the best living chevaliers. Without hesitation, he slid into the space where the dying man had stood, putting the wall of the crates at his back. As Michelle parried a pair of high thrusts, Briella scanned the other men. One of them had turned to look for her. She fired. An arrow, and the arrow punched cleanly through his chainmail and found his lung. The others turned and saw her then, and she gave the biggest one a grin as she raised her bow for another shot. He stumbled back, looking for cover, and Michelle stabbed the soldier in the knee, then sank his dagger into the man's throat. You turn your back on an Orlesian chevalier, dogs? Michelle shouted, kicking the man to the dead man to the ground as the others stumbled back. Face me in combat and die with more honor than you deserve. Or don't, Blasson said as he came around the corner. He raised his staff and a coiling tendril of blue light snaked out across the remaining men. The air hissed, then snapped with an explosion of frost, and the soldiers stood frozen in place, a sheen of ice glittering around them. One of them had been caught in the middle of a scream. Blesson pointed his staff at the wall of crates, and a jet of green fire ripped through the crumbling wood. The entire stack shuddered, swayed, and then crashed down on top of the frozen soldiers with a sound like someone taking a hammer to a shelf full of fine porcelain. I could simply have shot them, Brella said. Bits of frozen red skated and bounced around the great pile of rubble. Oh, probably, Felesson said, spinning his staff. Panting, Michelle looked up at Briella in confusion. I seem to owe the two of you a debt. We can discuss it once you're safely back at the palace, Briella said, climbing carefully down at the, from the crates. She torn her skirts, but there's, there'd been no helping it. At her voice, Michelle blinked. Miss Bria? Her Majesty's handmaid? What? No, that would be madness. 
Vlasin gestured, and his staff shivered and shrank down until it was a simple stick again. We need to get you out of here, Sir Marshal. Brial glanced at his wounded side. Can you walk? Of course. He turned to one of the dead men on the ground and yanked a small dagger free from the man's eye, then turned to the body of the bard Mulkinder. He checked her pockets with quick efficiency, then rose. Let us depart. The three left the warehouse. Flassen and Michael Michelle's eyed each other speculatively. The Chevalier and the Dalish Mage. Briala was looking elsewhere. Why did they take you? She asked, as they came out onto the street. If anyone had noticed the sound of fighting inside, they were keeping them to themselves. The elves in the square did not did their business around the Ven Nadal, and spared Briella and her companions not a single look. Melkinder that said that Gaspard had asked her to get me away from the Empress's side today, and Michelle looked back at the warehouse. I regret that she succeeded. How? Brielle stepped in until Michelle stepped back. How did she lure you here? It is a matter of honor. Shut up, my Michelle. As he blinked, Brielle stared at him hard. You were drugged at the tavern, not the palace. You would not ignore your duty for something trivial, so she either threatened you or lured you with something. You found nothing on the body, so it wasn't something she stole from you. A fake note from a fam from a friend? A family member? He flinched, though he himself would not have even noticed the tiny flicker of, at, a, at the corner of one eye. But I doubt any friend of the Empress's champion would be found in a tavern in the slums. And you have no living family. The flinch again. Family was the key. I don't answer to you, knife ear, Michelle said. His stolen dagger clutched tightly in one hand, not yet raised. If our mistress had questions, she would not send her handmaid to ask them. No, you fool. She'd send her spy. Briella turned to Flassen. Knife here. Flassen stifled a yawn. I was offended. Were you offended? No. Because he has never called me that before. Not when giving orders to the servants. Not even when he was in a rush. Briella smiled. Which means he's covering, trying to distract me. What is it, Michelle? A scandal in your family history? No. Urgent news would not bring you away. Ah. His face paled as she nodded in satisfaction. Falsified family title. Count Bravin must have seen something extraordinary in you. Not his ability to hide his facial expressions, obviously, Flossen said. When you're used to wearing a mask, you forget to hide the de little tells. And I assume only nobles can join the Chevaliers? Falassin said. You assume correctly. And what is more, falsifying a title is punishable by death. Briella glanced down at Michelle's hands. Commoner? No, not just that. He leaned a little too hard on knife ear. Elven mother? Be quiet. Michelle said. His voice barely more than a whisper. The dagger shifted into a fighting grip Brielle recognized from years of knife training. Ease your grip on that dagger, Sir Michelle. I doubt you could kill us both in broad daylight with no one noticing. And let me assure you. She gave him a hard smile. Celine would notice my absence, and she would be very thorough in her investigation. Michelle lowered the dagger, his hand shaking. You're worse than the bard. The bard would have seen you disgraced and executed had you not killed her. Do you truly expect me to help her complete her plan? She pointed at him. Gaspard threatens our empress. I would not leave her without her champion at such a time of crisis. Did Melkandere inform Gaspard of your past? At her words, Michelle sad and shook his head. No. She wished to confirm it with me first. Good. Then with her death, we are all safe. And if Gaspard attempts something 
similar again, you will contact me immediately. Michelle looked at her in disbelief, and then over at Felsen. I consider it, Felsen said. You didn't handle it particularly well on your own. And you will keep a secret? Michelle asked, his voice stiff and formal. He sounded like a man being ordered to his death, even, on, even from Celine. On one condition, Brielle raised a single finger. One day, I will ask you for something, and you will do it for me, whatever it is, if you wish your secret to survive. One favor, Michelle spat. You expect me to believe that? One favor, yes. Brielle kept her voice cool. She could not pit her passion against his. A desperate man who saw his honor and his life endangered because needed cool reason above all. Any more than that, and you might decide it was worth it to simply kill me. I saw Melkindar back inside. She was dead before those soldiers ever arrived. Michelle grimaced, and Brielle lowered her voice. You have my word, as a knife ear, that when you complete your favor, your secret is safe forever, never written down, never whispered to a confidant, not even Celine. One favor, however steep it might be, but no more than that. Michelle hesitated, and Briella saw the idea starting darting across his unmasked face. First the insulted pride, and then the questions. Could he trust her? Could he kill her now and ensure the secrecy of his past? Could he agree and then kill her later? And finally, the twisted, bitter smile. If Gaspard sends another bard, he said, I may need your help. We have a deal. Good. Riel might have told him that he could trust her, that he would not have regretted this, would not regret the decision. But despite his peasant blood, he had worn the noble's mask for too long to believe those words. Instead, she turned to Flesson. It would be safer if we could be certain that no evidence was found in the warehouse. Flesson nodded. Delen, I believe I can guarantee that no evidence will be even found of the warehouse. Always a pleasure, these little visits. He walked back towards the warehouse, whistling merrily. After an awkward moment, Michelle beckoned to Briella. Shall we? As they left the elven slums, the warehouse started burning behind them. I have to be honest with you, Remick, Grand Duke Espad said as the coach stopped before the still smoldering warehouse. Today's hunt made for a singularly disappointing day. I never thought I'd look for a trip to the slums to help improve it. The building was trash, like everything here in the elven slums. The oily black smoke had been visible across most of the city, and now that night had fallen, the remaining embers outshone the cheap torches set up, set up around the square. Gaspard stepped out of his coach, adjusting his coat, with his good arm and squinting thoughtfully at the big tree in the center of the square. Behind him, Remek, the Duke of Lydes, stepped out as well. And here we are... Why, precisely, Grand Duke? I'm here because I had Selene's champion tied up in that warehouse, with Melkandar sending self-congratulatory mysterious notes. Grand Gaspard started to point, then winced and switched to the arm that had been burnt that afternoon. And now he's back at the palace, and would like to know why. He chuckled. And you're here because I'm a widower. And you think your daughter would make a lovely empress. Remick smiled, then looked cautiously around the square, which seemed deserted. I know you're not afraid to get dirty, Grand Duke, but I would not expect it to see you digging through rubble. No, I have people for that. Gaspard whistled, and from the shadows came men wearing the masks and livery of Gaspard's servants. No armor. Ramak asked as they approached. Behind them trailed an elf wearing a dirty, patched version of a tradesman's leathers. Make her know. Armor would scare the poor knife ears back into the shadows. I need them talking tonight, 
Gaspard smiled as his men, and the elf came into the pool of light near his coach. Good evening. What's your name, rabbit? Selig, my lord, the elf said to Gaspard's feet. Good man, Selig. Gaspard nodded to the burning warehouse. Now, my men said that they'd pay good coin to any elf who could tell me what happened over there. Yes, my lord, the elf said and swallowed. That was my warehouse. I rented out the space to merchants who couldn't afford the market district. A woman, a, a human woman, a singer. She came and said that she needed to use it. She said that she was working for you and... No, she didn't. Gaspard said, his smile never faltering. She didn't say a word of that. The elf blanched. Blanked. I must have misheard. You don't even know who I am. No, my lord. He swallowed. Anyway, I saw two elves coming into the warehouse after y your, after some soldiers who were working with the lady. I heard fighting, and then an unarmored man came out of the e with the elves. They talked in the square, the three of them. The man was angry at the elven woman. She said something he didn't like. The elven man just watched, and then he walked back into my warehouse, and it all caught fire all at once. The elf shook his head. The elven man had marks on his face, like the old stories about the Dalish. Dalish? Gaspard asked, laughing. You're not telling me tales, are you, Selig? No, no, my lord. And the woman, her, her, her clothes were too nice. She and the man who had been held, I followed them out of the slums. I have a pass to the merchant district. His eyes darted up to look Gaspard in the eye, glittering in the light from the warehouse, as he fished in his pockets. Gaspard waved him on. They went through it. The elven woman threw away her bow, red cedar, worth a golden royal or more, and she threw it away. Then they went towards the palace, and the woman put on a mask. The elven woman? Gaspard caught his head and let out a breath. Really? Don't see many of those. Rabbit and a mask. Listen to me, Selig. You've done well tonight. Now, I'm not going to give you gold, because giving you gold is just giving you a knife in the back. You know it, and I know it. But those men over there have some silver, and it'll be more than enough to build you another warehouse. Thank you, my lord. The elf bowed deeply, and Gaspard's men led him away. Are you actually going to pay him? Duke Mac asked beside the coach. I am. Gaspard turned to his future Grand Duke and smiled. Knife in the back would be safer, but you have to guess we've got a dozen of those big, glittery eyes on us right now, and they'd know. Right now, I'd rather see the I'd rather they see the man who helped rebuild the warehouse, the Empress's people burned down. I might need them later. Remak nodded, impassive behind his gold and silver mask. You're going to use the elves. I can't use whatever Melkinder had me had for me, whatever it was. It, it like as not went up in that. Gaspard jerked a thumb at the burning remains of the warehouse. But a Dalish spy and an elven assassin both working for Selene? Gaspard asked as he climbed back into his coach. Maker's breath. If I can't find a way to use that, I don't deserve the throne. And that is chapter four of The Mast Empire by Patrick Lee.